Welcome to the exchange. The S&P and the Nasdaq touching record highs after that hot jobs report, both on pace for their eighth positive week in the last nine. Our next guest says there is still more room to run. Joining me now is Tom Lee, managing partner and head of research at Fundstrat Global Advisors. He is also a CNBC contributor. Tom, it's great to have you here. Always great to get your thoughts. And you've been right because the market just keeps hitting new highs. Today's intraday action may be a little bit disconcerting for some. Is the leadership still intact, though, for the markets overall? Um, Dom, I think it's a good question because the market is extended and it's, it is a mature rally. We're going to be entering our 20th week next week. But I think we should be giving the stock market the benefit of the doubt. So today, stocks are wobbling. Not a surprise that there is some profit taking. We did actually have a good jobs number. So I'm, I'm probably saying one eyebrow is raised because we're selling off on good news. But with margin debt where it is, and I think the earnings backdrop being so strong and, and the Fed confirming that they're leaning towards cuts this year, I think the backdrop, is, as you noted earlier, is still very good for equities. What exactly is going to drive that? And we, we've talked about this idea. It could be underlying earnings growth. It might be the idea of people paying more for that dollar of earnings expected, multiple expansions, so to speak. What's the big tailwind that you see coming up for the markets overall? Um, it's really all three. Um, you know, I think there is upside to earnings. Earnings beat by 7% in the first quarter. So you're already one quarter in. And if consensus is 245, well, that might that means there could be $10, $15 of upside for just this year on earnings alone. On risk premia, which is, you know, what you should put as a PE multiple. Well, if the Fed starts cutting and the economy's resilient, uh, the PE is only 15 times X fang. And the third is really flows. Uh, there's still six trillion of cash on the sidelines. Margin debt is barely budged. It's below where it was in October 2023, which was just a few months ago. So I, I don't think investors are necessarily that risk on. I mean, I know the market is technically overbought, but Mark Newton, our head of technical strategy, says you don't really want to be, you know, using an overbought as a, as actually a sell signal because strong markets stay strong. Tom, you mentioned the idea that leverage isn't what it used to be at at points in the past. Does that take a massive market decline off the table? And if we did get a decline, how big in your mind could it be? Uh, Dom, for now, I think it does mitigate downside because when leverage is low, like margin debt at the NYSE, it means investors aren't long yet the backdrop is improving, so that, that means they have to use these pullbacks as chances to get long. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we, we expect an air pocket in the first half, um, something like 7% or more. It's just that there's so many top callers now that I think that's why there's still gas in the tank on this rally. All right, and last question. We have a few moments. The favorite part of the market for you, given the current valuation? Uh, well, there's there's... there's what I think are five things that are working this year, I don't really want to talk about all five, but to me, uh, you know, we know that technology and FANG, including NVIDIA, are working because of AI. And I think that's also pulling up, you know, the miners and Bitcoin because they, they are kind of correlated trades. The second thing that seems to be working are things that are related around uh, Ozempic and, and reducing weight loss because of the productivity benefit to workers. But to me, the third, maybe most interesting, is small caps. You know, we think there's 50% upside this year. They're trading at 44% of the price to book of large caps. So I, I do think that's really one of the sleeper stories this year. All right. Small caps to trade from Tom Lee at Fundstrat. Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend, Tom. Thanks, We're you back. too. Stocks right. wobbling after hitting all-time highs earlier in the session. NVIDIA's incredible run taking a bit of a breather. Here to weigh in on all of it is Jeremy Siegel, professor of finance at the Wharton School and chief economist at Wisdom Tree. We got a lot to talk about, Professor, and it's great to have you on this Friday. So you're going to walk away on, on, to the weekend thinking what now about this rally? Well, well Scott, uh, when you have trending stocks, when you have momentum stocks, there's a very old saying in Wall Street, and it is up the staircase, down the elevator. And if you take a look at NVIDIA uh, and other trending stocks, that's what happens. Momentum players move on. They have very tight uh, stops on it. As long as it's going up, they're there. And as soon as it breaks their trend line, boy, they're out. Um, We have what's called a one-day reversal, new high, then low. 
my experience is that's rarely the final high for the stock. Usually you have a couple days, uh, you know, uh, uh, mixing on the on the price uh and 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 then uh, it will re- resume its uh, upward course so this is this is something i've seen many many times before and uh d- does not scare me okay so we the, the elevator goes down another floor or two but then you get back on the escalator and you start going up yeah yeah to consolidate yeah that's exactly right um it's kind of like a head fake i mean you know p- playing the momentum play requires a, a steal because, he, you know, when it goes down, it's so sharp. You say, oh, I'm going to get out. And then what happens, it goes back up to new highs, and you're so angry at yourself for getting out, you get on again. Uh, and it goes up another group. And and then what happens at the very end, and I don't think we're at that very end, is you're saying, hey, you know, you know diamond hands, I'm not selling this. It doesn't matter what. Unfortunately, that's usually the very top. Well, professor, not now, now you're now you're using some of the lingo from the mean stock mania. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, you know, I, I'm not saying they're mean <laughs> stocks at all because these are real companies. But uh, you know, we take you know take a look at what happened to Cisco in 1999 and 2000. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, this was a great company, got overvalued. Um, but we're you know, could we talked about this last time? Could Nvidia get there? Yeah, but it would be at a much higher price to get to what Cisco's evaluation was in 2000 sure. compared to what Nvidia is now. Does it does it tell you though when you watch a stock like this go up seemingly every day and it, it, it just reaches these heights that make you sit back and say I just can't believe what this stock is doing. Does it does it tell you that there's just too much froth in certain parts of the market but not the whole thing? It, it, it tells me that we're beginning to get the trend followers and the momentum players. And they, and they don't care what the valuation is. They don't care what the stock does. They don't care what the company does. They got their charts. They say, wow, with this trend over there, you know, make the trend your friend. And I'm making it my, uh, my friend. And I got my stop there. I'm riding it up. Um, you know, everyone's convinced that they can jump off the train before it goes off the cliff. Uh, and I'm not saying that NVIDIA is at all ready to do that, but these are the games that uh, speculators play, and I, I'm beginning to see more of those sort of players move into the market. Um, and uh, uh, But it's extremely early stage, uh, not late stage, because, uh, you know, when, uh, 25 years ago, um, you know, it had been going on for many years before finally it cracked. But you're, you're painting a scenario, though, in which exuberance starts to get a little bit irrational and then turns into pure euphoria. And that's when you have to worry. But you don't think we're anywhere near that stage yet? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. What did you make of Powell on the Hill this week, who came off to many, uh, maybe I, a little I more dovish than, than little, expected? Yeah, a little bit dovish. I mean, he said, and we're close. I, I didn't expect that. I mean, he could have shaded it. Who, uh, you know, I was, you know, we, we saw that January report a little worried. It means we got a lot more work to go. But I think, you know, maybe, maybe got some inkling of, you know, a rather softish, good wage number that we're having now. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, seeing some slowdown saying, you know, you know, we, we, we are very, very close. I think next Tuesday's number, uh, CPI, and which of course is going to be the last one before the March 20th FOMC is going to be quite important. Um, I, yeah, I really like to see a reversal of that from the uptick that we had in January. And I think that that, that is definitely possible. How many rate cuts are we getting this year, Professor? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, we talked about that. Um, if we get too many, I'd worry because that means the economy is crashing. So, you know, you know, you just say, oh, I just want as many as possible. No, you don't want as you don't want as many as possible. And in fact, uh, you know, as, as as Mike said earlier, it's it's much it's much more important for the economy to stay strong uh, than for us to have, you know, a rate cut in May or maybe June or earlier or later. However, I mean, I think, you know, my, my feeling is, is that we're going to have rate cuts. However, let me warn you, in how many days is it going to be? March 20, 12 days. I think we're going to have less rate cuts on the dot plot than we did in December. 
uh, because I think, honestly, Fed officials are, are surprised and pleased the strength of the economy. And they say, you know, you know, we don't have to cut that soon, you know, and uh, I can afford to wait a little longer before I can squelch in inflation. So that that might rattle the market a little bit. But, uh, you know, it's only because of the strength of the economy, not because they're, you know, stubborn and won't do it beforehand. In fact, Jay Powell says, I'm not waiting until all the inflation is wrung out before, you know, I'm going to start cutting, which would obviously be too late at that point. How far do you think the S&P can stretch? We call it, what are we, we're 5130. We, we can call it oh, now. Boy. What seems reasonable to you? Well, you know, we're 21 times forward earnings. Earnings are holding in very well and might actually come in a little bit higher. That's a full valuation, so I may say 5, 10% over. Um, hey, can we get 50% over, 60, 70? Absolutely. Just like we can get 50% under at the bottom of the bear market. Uh, you know, that, that is the emotion that has always swung markets over the decades, over the centuries. Um, and, um, you know, it's the type of volatility that a long-term holder in stocks has to get used to, uh, well, you know, to reap the benefits of, of the long-term returns. Let me ask you one more question before I let you run. Have you been watching how Apple has been trading in the last, you know, several weeks? Do you, do you have any concern about it? What do you make of it for a stock that we used to say, as Apple goes, perhaps so goes the market? Not so much today. Well, you know, I mean, I, and, and one we could ask, you know, the first one maybe to topple. I, I'm not saying Apple is going to topple from the Mag 7. I mean, but Tesla, uh, you know, the competition. Again, look, look, you know, I mean, what Tesla's got in China, which Musk has said, you know, this could be a problem besides all the other problems that EV has, and that's quite to what Tesla, I don't know, down, what, 50% from its high. Now, Apple is still, I mean, this this type of reaction from Apple, if you take through history, is certainly nothing uh, unusual, and it still has a, a great base. But, um, you know, there is some competition. Uh, you know, take a look at the, the, the Magnificent Nine that reached their peak in 2000. How many of those are left? A few, but, um, you know, nothing stays at the top forever. We'll make that the last word. Enjoy the weekend. We'll see you soon. Professor Jeremy Siegel, the Wharton School. I do have a news Thank alert you, to tell you about on Amazon. Fortune is reporting that the FTC has begun probing Amazon's new fees on U.S. sellers. The sellers are reportedly not happy with those new fees, which require sellers to either pay Amazon or begin shipping goods to at least four separate warehouses on their own dime. And another charge that punishes sellers for consistently low inventory. The FTC did not have any comment to CNBC about that story. We've reached out, of course, to Amazon and we'll update you with their response. If, in fact, we do get one, that stock down a little less than 1% on the session coming up. Next guest says she's finding opportunity in value names that have been left for dead in the current market. Joining me now, Christina Malbon of Patient Capital Management. Christina, welcome back. It's nice to see you. Thanks so much for having me, Scott. I'll get to these value plays in a minute, but as I look at the notes, the thing that honestly jumps out the most to me is that you say big tech like Alphabet, Meta, and Amazon are still being underpriced, underpriced by the market. How so? Well, we think Google's a great example of this, right? So on the surface, you look at Google and you say it's trading at a market multiple. But if you actually start stripping out the businesses that are losing money or are under monetized, you're really paying a below market multiple for the core of Google. On top of that, we're at the very beginning of an AI trend. And we know that Google has the most publications in AI research. And so they have put out an updated Gemini version that many are touting as as good, if not better, than ChatGPT. And we think longer term, the AI trend is going to accrue to the cloud players. And so we think Google is very well positioned. And so that's what I mean when we say that they are underpriced, that there's groups within the Magnificent Seven that are not pricing in Euphoria yet. Sure, but part of, I mean, if you want to take Alphabet specifically, I mean, part of their roll, rollout of, you know, some of their AI-related initiatives have been what some have termed an embarrassment. I mean, even those, you know, close to the company have sort of panned what they've done thus far. Yeah, so I agree with that, right? And we've had a ton of negative PR in relation to that. 
I think for us, we're long-term investors. And so we hold things, you know, three, five, 10 years. And so this sort of negative PR blimp on the radar, we think will be long forgotten over a five-year period. And we like to capitalize on those opportunities by adding to those positions or building a position when the market is negative on a story. So if we're talking value names, what, what kinds of things should we be looking at? Yeah, so we like to think about value outside of the you know typical low price to book um, parameters. We think nowadays that there's a lot of value in the market for companies that can sustain growth for longer than the market expects or that are under earning, kind of like we highlighted with Google. And so a name that we're really excited about is Canada Goose. And you all might know Canada Goose as, you know, the luxury down jacket company. But what I think is underappreciated is that they have been on an innovation front. They're expanding beyond heavyweight down. They're moving into lightweight down and clothing. And at the same time, they're expanding to a direct-to-consumer marketing, which is costing a lot of money to build up. So what we've seen is margins are compressed. So if you're just screening for stocks, you're going to say, hey, this company is trading for 20 times earnings. But it, it's actually at a margin that's over half of what it, the core is actually earning. So if you actually look at what the core is earning, it's trading at 10 times. And so we think that as they move forward and gain scale on the investments that they've made, and as they go to cut costs, which they've announced a cost-cutting program, that margins are actually going to build a lot faster than consensus has priced in, and we see it as a bargain. What about Royalty Pharma? Why do you like that name, which is, which is on your list in front of me? Yeah, so this is, once again, another name that I think you kind of need to dig into the details to really understand where it's trading. And so this is a company that buys pharmaceutical royalties, and they're the largest purchaser of royalties in the market. And it traded down over the last year as interest rates increase. And the reason for that is they make a low teens return on these royalty deals. And so as interest rates went up, people became concerned about the spread between the return they were making and where they could borrow at. What we got confidence in is that they are extremely disciplined and they actually manage the underwriting to maximize on the spread between their cost of capital and the return on these deals. What's also a little bit tricky is that their gap accounting is completely off. So when they buy a royalty, they make an estimate of what that royalty is worth and then they account for it in gap at the current valuation, but they have to adjust it up or down based on changes in assumptions. So the gap number just really isn't reflective of what they're taking home in cash mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And if you look at what they're taking home in cash, this is a firm trading at eight times that is deploying capital in a market where we've seen capital pull back from biotechs. So we saw last year, there was almost no new capital going to these young companies with innovative products. And that really lends itself to Royalty Pharma being able to buy these quality royalty assets when no one else is available. Furthermore, you see cash-strapped legacy players like Teva do deals with them when they want to monetize assets in their pipeline that they can't prioritize given the debt that they have to focus on repaying. Christina, thank you. We'll see you soon. Christina thank Malbon so joining much. us. Up next, we're tracking the big Okay, so in this last video, we had Tom Lee of Fundstrat. We had Jeremy Siegel. He's the chief economist at Wisdom Tree. We also had Christina Malbin. She's the uh, works at Patient Capital Management. And uh, we're going to go over some of the stocks and ETFs that were discussed, the sectors, uh, but also some additional sectors that were not discussed uh, that I haven't touched on for a little while. So I want to look at those as well, see how they're performing recently. Um, in my prior video, I covered a lot of stocks, all right? The prior video covered Apple, you can see here AMD, Broadcom, all these stocks, Google, all right, NVIDIA, and it was done earlier today. So I don't wanna go over that again, Bitcoin, gold, all the indices, uh, industrials, and real estate. <clears throat> so in this video, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go over some of the things discussed in this previous video. Uh, that was this uh, video right here that you just watched and uh, like I said some of the sectors so let's start with Amazon um, Amazon was down 0.83 percent on Friday and uh, it dropped under 
the green line. Now, the green line is the Tankinson. That is the highs and lows of the last nine periods divided by two. And um, so it's, think of it as an equilibrium level. It's not too far away from it. It's nothing major, nothing uh, uh, serious to be concerned about here because we are also above the Kijinson. We're above the cloud. Um, it's just maybe a, a warning that, hey, this could potentially drop further because it, it you can see here the prior day and Thursday, price did close above it. So it looked like a, a, an optimal entry point. But the bad news that occurred on Friday um, that you just heard uh, made it drop a little bit, but not a lot. So that's where we're at with Amazon. Let's look at Canada Goose. That's one of the stocks um, talked about at the end there from in the last interview. Um, on the daily chart, it's, uh, you know, it was, it's, it's highs. If we go back in time, let's go back in time. Let's find out what its all-time highs were, all right? Let's look at the monthly chart. We're using the TC2000 platform, so it can help us identify trends. It can help us, uh, you know, get a, a better perspective on stocks before we take any a plunge uh, and purchase some of these stocks. Now, the high of this stock was $72.93. That goes back to November 30th of 2018, all right? Here are the years down here. Now, on the monthly chart, what you'll see is price is still under the Tenkinson. It's under the Kijinson. It's under the cloud. Long-term perspective, it's not an investable stock at this point, in my opinion. Um, now, weekly chart, it's also under the cloud. So not a stock I'd be interested in entering. Okay. It has showed some strength here on the daily chart. If you're a, you know, a short-term trader and an active trader and you don't mind getting in and out of stocks, um, does it look like it have has some potential well if it gets above this level here the 1320 level uh, i could certainly see that but again you want to see a uh, you know correlation between the higher time frames like the weekly chart okay uh, to confirm before you enter on a daily chart in my opinion let's look at meta on the daily chart still very strong it was down 1.22 percent on Friday, uh, but still holding up above the Tenkinson, a very strong support level. And then on the weekly chart, also looking really good, you know, experiencing new highs. So Meta is doing really, really well, in my opinion. And I like this stock a lot still. Netflix on the weekly chart, also doing really well. Look at this very positive chart, um, holding up quite well. It was just down 0.61% on Friday. It did drop a little bit slightly under the Tenkinson, but uh, again, nothing to be overly concerned about here here's another stock that was um talked about by tom lee he actually recommended uh, uh well he talked about ozempic for a moment there and i like this chart on the daily it was down negative two percent 2.1 percent on friday let's look at and see what this looks like on the weekly it's a little bit far away from the tangents in here i'd like to see it drop just slightly more maybe down here to another three percent uh, for a more optimal entry, you'd be getting it at a cheaper price uh, and it would be more closer to its equilibrium level. But let's look at the weekly. Yeah, weekly looks really good too. So I like this chart. Uh, you can see the volume has been increasing these last three days, I mean, three last three weeks here. And the ADX is strong on NVO. That's Novo Nordisk is the name of the company that, create, that has the Ozempic uh, pharmaceutical there. Here's another one that was talked about, Royalty Pharmacy, Pharma, I'm sorry, Royalty Pharma. <clears throat> this one it was at the end. Um, also, not something I'd be interested in. You can see here, it's under the cloud, right? It has showed some strength recently, but look what happened. It came to it right there last week on uh, the week of um, March 1st, right? Touched, got close to the bottom of the cloud and then retracted. Um, let's look at this on the daily. It's going to look probably more optimistic, but yeah, it's, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's experiencing higher highs, higher lows. What you want to see if price gets above the tank and sink closed above as a short term trader, I'd say, yeah, it looks good. Um, but I would not be interested in a, uh, in this stock until the confirmation on the weekly on, on another note, the profit margins are super high. It's 48.2% profit margin. So that's really good. 
uh, their price of sales is a little bit high at 5.34. Beta is just 0 .35, 0 0.35, which means it doesn't really move that much, generally speaking. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's what I have for you on that one. Now let's go through the, the sectors very quickly here. XLB is materials. Uh, we created a bearish engulfing pattern. Um, it was down 0.58% on Friday. It may drop a little bit more, but it, it's a very strong chart. Nonetheless, you can see that price has been in this very strong uptrend for a little while, and it looks good on the weekly as well. This is the weekly chart. How about energy? Energy, interesting. So on the weekly chart, it looks relatively good. And I say relatively because if you if we take a closer look here at the let me circle it so you can see it right there. The green line, that's the Tenkinson has crossed under the Kijinson. That shows um, bearishness. So energy, um, I'd like to see the Tenkinson cross above the Kijinson here, the red the green line get that's the faster moving average get above this red line, the 26 period highs and lows divided by two. I'd like to see that first um, before you know jumping into energy. It does I'm sure it looks good on the daily. Yeah, on the daily chart it has broken through some levels here. So if you're an active trader this does look really good because it you can see that it has has a, a higher high here than this prior high, higher low here than this low. Uh, overall, I'm liking what I'm seeing So, uh, for the shorter term. Now, financials on the daily chart, very strong, very strong. Very rarely has it actually closed under the Tenkinson green line, just once here on February 13th. So, uh, and then prior to that, it was uh, back here on January 18th. So it's been a very strong uptrend. Look at this. And when stocks are in this type of move and the momentum is still strong, okay, there's absolutely no reason to be exiting just because you think it's, you know, it's overbought because you, ne you never really know when uh, the, the trend is going to change until the chart gives us that information. It hasn't given us that info yet. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm still very bullish on the financials. Let's take a look at XLK. XLK is also very strong. It did break and close under the Tenkinson here, but it's holding up above this blue line. Now, what is the blue line? It's the weekly. Um, it's the weekly time frame, okay? And uh, it's it's based on a weekly chart. Anyway, I, I, I like it still. It's still very strong. Technology is still doing well overall. You know, we've had these little slumps here and there, but overall, I like what I'm seeing. Okay, let's continue with XLP. This is consumer staples. This is the daily chart. It's been in a very strong uptrend. Um, still holding up above everything. It was down 0.79% on Friday. How about the weekly chart? On the weekly chart, we finally broke above the cloud, the Ichimoku cloud. Tenkinson is above Kijinson. That's what you want. You see the ADX is moving up. A couple of negatives that I'm seeing here, though. We still are below this high, right? So we have not created a new high yet. We haven't created a new higher low. This low is lower than this low. So that's on the weekly. Again, uh, it's very likely it's going to find some resistance in this area here between 76 and $78. Very likely it's going to find a little resistance. It could pull back a little bit, create a, a leg down, and then take off from there. How about utilities? Um, utilities is very weak, guys. Look at this. Um, under the cloud, we did get a positive here, positive week, right? It was up 0.25% on Friday, but under the Kumo, not a good thing. How about on the daily chart? On the daily chart, just broke above the, uh, the Ichimoku cloud, so that's good. We got a couple of negative candles here. Um, I'd be holding off on utilities for the time being. That's just me though. How about consumer discretionary? This is the daily chart we're looking at now. We have a higher high here than this high. That's good. We have a higher low than this low and this low. So, but price has been kind of stuck in this zone between the two moving averages. I'd like to see it get above the green line or the 182.37 level. That level is based on this pivot candle right here. So if it gets back above it, 
I'd be more bullish with the consumer discretionary. And that's going to do it for this video. If you guys like this software that, that I'm using here, it's called TC2000. There is a link down below in the description uh, section, all right, of this channel. And there's a link that will give you a discount if you happen to be a subscriber to the channel. Does it cost anything to be a subscriber? No, it's free. So definitely hit that subscribe button and like this video so that it helps the, with the algorithm. It helps us support the channel so more people get turned on to it and we can get more views and I can create more videos as a result of your support. And that's the whole idea behind this. So thanks guys and I'll catch you all in the next video.